Amen, amen. Everybody say amen. amen. Are you ready and awake? 10 a.m. service? Are you glad to be in church today? All right, that's like three of you. The rest of you, we got some work to do. Uh, well, here you go. Matt just talked about my, my uh, I think he used the word hilarious jokes. And so um, after hearing a sermon from his pastor on lying and cheating and deceit, a man was extremely convicted about cheating on his taxes. So he went home and sat down and he wrote a, the following letter to the IRS. He said, I have been unable to sleep knowing that I have cheated on my income tax. I understated my taxable income, so I have enclosed a check for $150, sincerely, taxpayer. P.S., if I still can't sleep, I will send the rest. <laughs> I just want to say, uh, last Sunday, I received this beautiful card from one of our children in our church, and I just want to read it to you. It says, Dear Pastor John, thank you for being my parents and grandma's pastor. You are funny. My mom likes your jokes and tells a lot of people about them. LOL. Grace. Grace is obviously a very wise young lady. God bless you, Grace. Today is the, the fifth and final message of a series that we've called The Return of the King, a study in First and Second Thessalonians. And uh, the primary theme, the reason I chose these two books, primary theme is the coming of the Lord, what is often called the second coming of Christ. Uh, Thessalonians deals with what theologians call eschatology, which is the study of last things or the study of the end times. And this is part two. Today is part two of the message. This is the, the last message of the whole series. And this is part two of the message that I started last week that I called Running with the Horses. Running with the Horses based on 1 Thessalonians 5. We're going to get to 1 Thessalonians 5 in a, in a minute. You can turn there right now if you want to. If you missed the message last Sunday, I'd encourage you to go back and, and watch it. It'll give you a little bit more context for where we're going today. Uh, but we talked about how the Bible says that we are living in the, in the last hour and the Antichrist is coming. 1 John chapter 2, 18, little children, it is the last hour and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists, lowercase a, false prophets have come by which we know that it is the last hour. The Antichrist, I explained last week, is, is a, a false prophet, an incredibly evil, wicked being who will set himself up against Christ and the people of God, Christians, in the last days before the second coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you can flip there if you want to. I'm just going to pull out a few verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul talks about the Antichrist uh, in this passage in verse 3. He says, let no one deceive you. That's a common theme in First and Second Thessalonians is, is deception because that's, that's what's going to happen in these last days to some. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day. New King James capitalizes the, the word day because it's referring to the day of the second coming of Christ, the return of the king. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The falling away, that, that's a term that refers to a massive re rebellion against Jesus Christ by those who refuse to believe in him and follow him during the great tribulation. One of the reasons we know that this has not yet happened, that we're not to this point of history yet, is because in the last 40 years, 4-0, the last 40 years, approximately 1.6 billion, with a B, 1.6 billion people have come to Christ in the last 40 years alone. So some, some believe that that is more than the previous 1,970 years combined. In other words, since Jesus died, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. In other words, God is on the move in the world. Jesus is building his church. The gates of hell will not and cannot prevail. Uh, but we haven't hit that point of history yet. We're the falling away. And then Paul says, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Those are two other names or titles that Paul uses for the Antichrist. Skip down to verse 9. 
The coming of the lawless one, which is another title, a third title for the Antichrist we see in this passage. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Whether or not the actual person of the Antichrist is here now, personally, by the way, I don't think so. I don't believe this to be so. Some of you that maybe have been married and divorced, you might think that your ex-spouse is the Antichrist, but I don't know. But the, the, spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist is here. The Bible says clearly, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. And so we, I talked about this last week, that the spirit of the Antichrist is seen in the spirit of the four horses that we read about in Revelation chapter 6. The, sometimes people call them the, the four horses of the apocalypse. And we, we talk, touched on this last week, the four horses the white horse, which is disruption and deception. The red horse, which is fear and violence. The black horse, economic collapse. The pale horse, disease and death. We see this spirit of the Antichrist in our world now. And Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5 says, So Jeremiah, and I think you can insert your own name there. So Cindy, so Peter, so Edwin, so... Deanna, so John, so Jeremiah, if you're worn out in this foot race with men, what makes you think you can race against horses? And if you can't keep your wits during times of calm, what's going to happen when troubles break loose like the Jordan in flood? So this is what we talked about last week, but let me mention it again. In the midst of living in a world where the spirit of the Antichrist is increasing, is, is growing, where there's increasing amounts of disruption and deception and fear and violence and economic collapse and disease and death, you and I, the church of the living God, we are called to run with the horses. No matter what happens in our world, no matter what happens in our circumstances beyond our control, no matter what happens in your own life personally, no matter if this is the very last generation before the king returns, we are called to run with the horses. The spirit of Jesus Christ is in us, is in us, and he is greater than the spirit of the Antichrist who is in the world around us. Which takes us back to 1 John 4. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. That's referring to the false Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 teaches us how to run with the horses, how to run with the horses. In other words, how we can live powerfully and successfully and victoriously as we watch, as we prepare for Jesus' return as the spirit of the Antichrist intensifies. And these verses that you'll see in a moment, they read kind of like a checklist for end times living. In fact, I'm giving you points and I'm giving you a little checklist as we go along as well. You can give yourself a letter grade as you follow along. And just like you would in school, give yourself a letter grade. If you get a C or lower on any of them, by the way, then that's something that you need to take to prayer and work on and ask God to help you change and grow and mature. I know some of y'all thought in school C's get degrees, but C's as a Christian are not good enough. You're not called to be an average Christian. Come on, somebody. You're more than a conqueror. So, uh, so I gave you three last week. Run with spiritual covering. Run with ministry. Run with grace. I gave you three. Today we're going to finish the list. I'm going to give you the final six uh, uh, points here. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. We're going to read the rest of the chapter. In fact, go ahead and stand to your feet if you would, everybody. Real quick, stand to your feet. Let's read the word of God. Let's pray. Father, speak to us. Encourage us, challenge us, change us, and transform us through the power and the truth of your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. amen. Let's, we're going to start in verse 16. We're going to read verses 16 
to 22 together. You'll see how short they are. Just read them out loud together. Ready, go. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Good, I'll read the rest. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. As you're seated, look at the person next to you. Turn to the person next to you and greet them with a holy kiss. Come on, do it. That's what the Bible says. Yes, I just got a holy kiss from my wife. Come on, somebody. I hope if you're married, I hope you kissed your spouse and you didn't kiss somebody else. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. (laughs) <laughs> how to run with a horse is a checklist for end times living we're picking up here on point number four number four is run with joy run with joy if you if you've never memorized the bible verse ever in your whole life you can memorize one right now all right i'm gonna teach you how they do it in sunday school you say the the reference then you say the verse then you say the reference again we're gonna do that class come on everybody say it with me first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 now, there's like three of you doing this. Come on, let's do it again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Congratulations, pat yourself on the back. You just memorized a verse. Rejoice always. Run with joy. Run with joy. I think a great definition of joy is from Kay Warren, Rick Warren's wife. She wrote a book called Choose Joy. She says, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. By the way, notice I gave you scripture references here that you can look up. Philippians 4, most joyful book of the Bible that Paul wrote from jail is Philippians. The quiet, joy is the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And the determined choice, the determined choice to praise God in every situation. Joy is a choice. You're as joyful as you choose to be. If you're connected with the Lord, you can, you can choose to be miserable or you can choose to be joyful. You can choose to be fearful. You can choose to be joyful. You can choose to be resentful. You can choose to be joyful. If I'm giving myself a grade on this, this is one that I have to come back and work on often because it doesn't come easily or naturally to me. i got to work on joy. Listen, you don't rejoice for your circumstances because sometimes we face circumstances that are terrible. Things happen in our life. You don't rejoice for your circumstances, but you can still rejoice in your circumstances. If you're a parent of a teenager right now, you're probably not rejoicing for the fact that you have teenagers that are talking back to you and don't pick up their room and, you know, all the other things that come along with being a teenager, but you can rejoice in their teenage years. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be parent of a teenager because you're using it to build my patience. Lord, help me to not kill them because I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. Come on, somebody, say amen. It's It's a joke. Joy is not based on what is happening externally, Externally in the world around us, it's based on what is happening internally in our hearts because joy comes from the Lord. The, the truth, men and women, the truth that God loves you unconditionally. God Almighty loves you unconditionally. He loves you unconditionally that he has saved you through his son Jesus, that he has called you, he has chosen you, he has adopted you into his family, he has made you a child of God, he has made you a son or daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that Jesus is coming back again for you, the fact that Jesus conquered death and sin and the powers of hell. Come on, somebody. Heaven is your home. That ought to give you great joy. You, no matter what is going on, joy comes from the Lord. And if that doesn't bring you joy, then, then take heart in the fact that there's only 46 more days till the NFL kicks off on September 5th. It's coming. Jesus is coming soon. The NFL is coming soon, too. All right, so life is short. Enjoy the journey. Run with joy. Nehemiah 8, 10, do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Philippians chapter 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. 
Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Listen to this phrase. I've never even noticed this phrase before in Philippians. Remember the Lord is coming soon. In other words, the, the fact that Jesus, the, the King, is coming again, there's joy connected in that because our hope is in him. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. That leads us to point number five, run with prayer. Run with prayer. Here's another verse you can memorize. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Don't raise your hand or respond too loudly. This I don't want any of the husbands especially to get in trouble. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they do all the talking nonstop? You don't even have a chance to get a word in? No, that, was, that was too loud. I don't know who that came from, but is there anything? Yeah, that's my wife every day. It's like the guy whose wife had been talking to him for a long time. Finally, she stopped and she said to him, you weren't even listening, were you? Finally looked at her and he replied, that's a pretty weird way to start off a conversation. <laughs> Jenny tells me I have two faults. Number one, I don't listen. Number two, something else. I can't remember. I don't know what it is. <laughs> my, my mom's sitting here in the front row. My mom's mom, Grandma Marge, she's, she's in heaven now. Grandma Marge would talk without ceasing. She lived in Sacramento. She would call you up. Hey, Grandma, how you doing? Those were the last words you got in that conversation. She would just go. She'd take off like a jet, and you could put the phone down. You could put it in a drawer. You could go vacuum the house. You could wash your dog. You could do the laundry. You could come back an hour later. She's still talking. And you say, Grandma, it's great talking to you. Have a great day. And hang up on her. She, would, she never even knew. That, that My Grandma Marge would fall asleep on the couch. I'm not making this up. I couldn't make this up. She'd fall asleep. She'd be talking to you as she's reading the newspaper. And she's doing all the talking. You're just sitting there just listening to her babble on and on and on. She's talking. And then she would start to fall asleep, you know, and she'd start snoring. She'd be out for about three, four minutes. And then she'd wake, wake back up again. And she would pick up mid-sentence where she left off. It was like some crazy spiritual gift that woman had. She's in heaven now talking to anybody who's going to listen. I guarantee you. It's like, I got to spend eternity with this woman. I'm getting away from her. I'll see you again, Grandma. God bless you. Praying without ceasing does not mean that you talk to God nonstop. It doesn't mean that you're walking around mumbling, praying. All. That's not what it means. It means that, that your conversation with God as you live in relationship with him is ongoing. It's continual. It means that prayer is your first option. It's not your last resort. It means that you always pray and you never give up, that you persist in prayer. It means that, that when you're fearful or you're anxious, you pray. Listen, if you only pray when you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Because... Prayer is the difference between the best that I can do and the best that God can do. And if you're going to run with the horses, if you're going to run with the horses in the spirit of the Antichrist in the world, you need to be a man or woman of prayer. You think, I don't know how to pray. Well, you know how to talk. Prayer is just talking to God. It's having a conversation. It's talking to God, casting your cares before him. Uh, I preached a series last year that I think is pretty well received called Bold Biblical Prayers. I started preaching it in June. You can look it up. And as a series of messages over the summer, I, well, anyways, we're gonna, I'm going to do part two of this series starting next week. We're going to talk about bold biblical prayers. I'm not preaching the same messages. It'll be new messages. In fact, some of our staff are going to preach. My mom's going to preach a message in a couple weeks. It'll be really good. We're going to teach you how to learn principles from the Bible, even prayers that you can actually pray. You'll be encouraged and equipped. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 says, Jesus often, he often slipped away to be alone so he could pray. Mark 1.35 says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark. Dang it, I wish it didn't say that. <laughs> Why did I have to say that? Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He got up. He, he got out of bed. He left the house. He went off to a solitary place where he what does it say, church? Where he prayed. Here's my challenge to all of us this week. I know some of us do this already. Some of us don't. My challenge to all of us this week is to get up 15 minutes early. Set your alarm for 15 minutes early. Get up 15 minutes early and spend that time with the Lord. Spend the first five minutes in the Word of God. Open up the Bible. Read it for your, Get a physical Bible, not your phone. Get a physical Bible. Read it for at least five minutes, all right? You can read that. You can read one chapter pretty easily, most chapters in five minutes. And then spend the next five minutes in prayer. Just talk to the Lord. Thank Him. You know, thank Him for you know, talk to the Lord in prayer. And then spend the last five minutes of that in worship. 
Get your favorite worship song. Turn it on and worship the Lord. And if you do that, some of us don't have this habit yet, the spiritual discipline, the spiritual habit. If you start to do that, do that every day this week, I'll, I'll bet you, you come back to me next week and say, Pastor, I did it. I noticed the difference. I bet you will. And you continue to do that. You become a, a person of prayer, a person who spends time with God in relationship with him. Your life will be different. You'll be able to run with the horses. Number six is run with gratitude. Run with gratitude. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. What does it say next? Unthankful. That, that, that word, and the list goes on, by the way, but that word's right in the middle, unthankful, which is why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So many of us think, what's the will of God for my life? Now, when we ask that question, I know we're thinking, what is the specific individual purpose? And we're going to end with that in a few moments. But the Bible says a couple of different times, this is the will of God for you. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, this is the will of God for you, that your sanctification, that you avoid sexual immorality. It says right here, part of the will of God for your life is to be thankful to the Lord, to live in an attitude of gratitude. I mentioned Corrie ten Boom last week in the message, at the very end of the message. She was a Dutch Christian, lived during World War II. Her father, her sister Betsy, lived together. They were hiding Jews, trying to protect Jews from the Nazis. They were found out, sent to concentration camp. Corrie and, and Betsy's father died pretty quickly because he was elderly. Corey and Betsy lived there for a while until Betsy actually ended up dying in the concentration camp. But they were, they were together in the same room for a while. And, and Corey, in her book, The Hiding Place, talks about her sister, Betsy. Betsy was, Corey was amazed at Betsy in the worst possible conditions you can imagine in a Nazi concentration camp. Corey would talk about how much Betsy loved Jesus, how she would praise and worship, pray and seek the Lord. And she was, she was inspired by her sister. She kind of even get, would get annoyed with her sister, Betsy, sometimes. Because in, in, their, in their room, in their barracks where they lived, they had fleas. They literally had fleas and, 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 and bed bugs. And, and Betsy would tell her sister, Corey, Corey, we must praise God for, for the bed bugs. Corey's saying, what the heck are you talking about, Betsy? What you? Come to find out after Corey was released because she survived the concentration camp, she found out that the reason the Nazi guards never came and abused her and her sister and the other women in that room is because there were bed bugs. And Betsy, praise God for the bed bugs. That's amazing. Now, that's an extreme example, but I, I say it to make a point. Because complaining focuses on what others have that you don't have. And it says, what I have is not enough. Gratitude focuses on what God has given you and says, God, thank you. What I have is more than enough. Pastor Cindy just led a team to Malawi, and I was, I was hearing uh, one of our guys on the team talk about it. He said, they have nothing there. You are in a very, in one of the poorest of the poor nations, and the people are thankful and they're joyful, aren't they, Pastor Cindy? Why? Because, because they have a heart of gratitude. In fact, a heart of thanksgiving is a key to having peace and joy in your life. I don't know how you can have peace and joy in your life if you're a complaining person all the time. Psalm chapter 95, verse 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Some of you come here, you know, and we're singing songs. You think, I'm not going to sing. I don't have a good voice. You don't have to have a good voice. Just make a joyful noise. <laughs> Come into his presence with thanksgiving. You want the presence of God in your life? You need to answer it with thanksgiving and praise. Somebody say amen. No matter what happens, if you know the Lord, there is always something to be thankful for because we've been saved. We can thank God for the cross of Christ. We can also thank God that we live in Southern California and we have the best Mexican food in the world. That was the loudest amen I've got all day. Number seven is this. Run, I, I like this point. Number seven, run with discernment. Run with discernment. First Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21, we just read it. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. I'm going to give you a definition here that I made up. I think it's quite brilliant. Spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment is the supernatural ability to see 
and sense things with God's help through the Holy Spirit from God's perspective based on the Bible. I'm going to say it again. Spiritual discernment is the supernatural ability to see and sense things with God's help through the Holy Spirit from God's perspective, which is based on the Word of God, the Bible. I'll preach a series on the Holy Spirit before we end this year, but the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells and lives in you as followers of Jesus. He helps us live for Christ. Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit, John chapters 14, 15, 16. He calls the Holy Spirit our helper, our comforter, our counselor. And we just read, the Bible says, do not quench the Spirit. Some translations actually actually say, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Some of you are thinking, that's easy for me, pastor. I've never, the fire's never been lit before. Listen, then you need to get lit. Come on, somebody. And I'm not talking about how some of you young people are thinking about, all right? You, you need to get on fire. You need to get baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist says, I came and I baptized you with water, but one is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Some of you need to get you need to get on fire for the Lord. You need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. That was a weak, terrible, pathetic applause, but maybe I'm not preaching good. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He guides us. He says, go here, say this, do this. He guides us. He helps us in every situation. He warns us as well. Don't go there. Don't say that. Don't do that. Don't look at that. Come on, somebody. Don't become a Raiders fan. Don't, don't, don't do that. We need, to, we need to learn how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit and do not despise prophecies, it says. Prophecy is, is twofold. One of the, the aspects of prophecy in the New Testament is actually forth telling God's Word. In other words, that's what I'm doing right now. It's preaching, it's teaching, it is proclaiming the Word of God. That is, that is prophecy, that, that's prophesying. That's an aspect of prophesying. The other aspect that we often think of is foretelling or, or predictive, future-oriented. Words that are given by the Holy Spirit through God's people. Since the spirit of the Antichrist is here right now in the world, if we're going to run with the horses, we must run with discernment. We must know how to test, how to test all things from every and any source. And we are inundated daily with all kinds of sources and voices speaking to us. And we must test all things, by the way, including preaching and teaching from everybody, including from this pulpit as well. You need to run with discernment. I'm going to give you a very simple two-fold way to do it. I think there's, there's more, but let me just give you two. If a prophecy or message or word is from God, it must pass these tests. Number one, it must line up with the Bible. A prophecy, a message, a feeling, a sense, it must line up with the Bible. It will never, ever contradict Scripture. I'm just going to say this. I'm going to say this as your pastor in love, all right? I'm not trying to, to, to offend or, or, or condemn anybody. I just want to tell you this because I hear stuff like this. My mom hears, pastors hear stuff like this. You know, you're in a relationship with somebody. You're not married, but you're sleeping together. You're living together. And you'll say things like, well, we just feel a peace about it. We prayed about it. We felt like God said it was okay. Whatever voice you heard, that was not God speaking to you. Because the Bible is, God, the Word of God is clear on that. Avoid sexual immorality. That's any sex outside of marriage between a, a biological male and a biological female. Anything else, you're out of bounds. I say, God won't, the, the Word of God, God will never contradict Himself in the Bible. Uh, the second way is that it affirms, whatever you hear, it must affirm that Jesus Christ is the incarnate Son of God, that He is the sinless Savior of the world, that as He is revealed in Scripture, that is who He is. You hear anything else? That's what we just read in 1 John chapter 4. You hear anything else? That's not of God. It's an antichrist kind of spirit. The main point of prophecy is not prediction, it is hope. The main point of prophecy is to point people to Jesus, who is the living hope. We just sang about that a few moments ago. The, main, the, the primary purpose of prophecy is not prediction, it's preparation. It's so that you and I can live ready. Come on, we can live ready for the return of the king. That's what we've been talking about for five weeks now. One of the primary tools of the devil is deception, which is why we need discernment. 
fact, Jesus criticizes, he rebukes the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. He says, you hypocrites, you know how to, to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus is talking about his return. Listen to what he says. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, what does it say, everybody? Come on, say it again. Look up and lift up, it says. When these things begin to happen, look up. And lift up, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Go through life looking up, not around. Number eight is this, run with wisdom. Run with wisdom. Run with wisdom. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the acquaintance with any kind of information Wisdom is applying the right information. Knowledge you can get from any book. Wisdom you get from the book. Knowledge you receive from education. Wisdom you receive from God. Our universities are full of educated fools with all kinds of letters behind their names who deny and say, there is no God. They're educated fools. To quote the 90s hip-hop legend Coolio, I'm an educated fool with money on my mind. I got a tin in my hand and a gleam in my eye. I'm a loked-out gangster set tripping banger, and my homies is down, so don't arouse my anger. <laughs> just, just came out of my heart. You're like, who are your homies? Pastor Chris, Pastor Cindy, don't mess with us. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. Lord, I apologize. Let's, let's quote evangel, evangelist legend Billy Graham instead of Coolio. Knowledge is horizontal, but wisdom is vertical. It comes down from above. <laughs> Sorry. I don't even know why I made my voice like that. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. I, I preached a series on this a few months ago, but the fear of the Lord is not being scared of God. It is a healthy and proper recognition of who God is. It is realizing how awesome God truly is. It's real, realizing that God is bigger than anything in the world. He's bigger than anyone, that no matter what happens in our world, God is in control. The fear of the Lord is to honor and to respect God more than anyone or anything else, which is what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21-22 Tell us, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. That's called wisdom. That's called wisdom. Holding on to one, what is good, abstaining from what is evil, that's called wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make the right choice and do the right thing regardless of the consequences. Even when it hurts, even when it costs you something, regardless of what's happening in our world in any situation, it is believing and living the truth that God's ways are always better. That's called wisdom. Somebody say amen. Number nine, last point is this. Run with purpose. If you're going to run with the horses, number nine, you've got to run with purpose. Verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. This is a beautiful prayer. Paul emphasizes that it is God, it is God who is doing this work in us. We, of course, partner with God, but God is the one who's doing the work. He's faithful. He is the God of peace. That word peace is an amazing Bible word, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Peace is not just the absence of conflict. That's what we think about. But biblical peace, true Jesus kind of peace, is actually wholeness and well-being in our lives. 
That, that's what peace is. So even when there's not peace around you, peace can still be in you. And the prayer, the prayer is that God will sanctify us completely. He'll sanctify us completely. That word sanctify in the Greek, hagiazo, it means to make holy, to set apart, to be consecrated or dedicated to God, to be separated from evil things, to purify. It says God will sanctify you completely in every part of your being. Sancti- being sanctified or, or being holy, by the way, it does not mean perfect. I mean, obviously we know that Brett has a cussing problem that we just learned about in church news a few minutes ago. He's still being sanctified. <laughs> That's so funny. It, it means that every dimension of our lives, our spirit, our soul, our body, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, is set apart for God's purposes. The Amplified Bible says it like this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, that is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure, That's beautiful. Make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his what does it say? Come on, say it again. Set apart for what? For his purpose. Men and women, we don't just need provision to live on. We need purpose to live for. You you need, if you're going to run, if you're going to run your race, if you're going to run with the horses, if you're going to live all out for the cause of Christ, you need to run with purpose. That there, are, there are some general purposes that God has for every human being. And Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. It is a, a brilliant and amazing book. You ought to read it. And he talks about these five purposes. Number one, to center your life around God. Number two, to love God's family. Number three, to grow in spiritual maturity. Number four, to serve others. Number five, to tell others about Jesus. Every single one of us, that is a general, those are general purposes that God has for our life as Christians. But God also has a unique and a specific purpose for every single one of us individually. It is tailor-made just for you. And you think, how do I discover that? You discover that in relationship with him. I don't know. I can't tell you. you got to go to the Lord. you got to go to the one who created you to find out why he created you, why he's put you on this planet. I know that, that the purpose that God has in my life, at least in this season, is to lead the Kosh Church. And, and there are times, you ask Jenny, there are times when I don't always want to do that. And I think, I want to go be a gardener. I want to move to Montana or Wyoming or Texas or somewhere. And I want to just be a gardener. But I come back to my calling and my purpose in life. You need to discover what God's specific purpose is for your life. You need to know that God has put you on this planet, in this part of the world, in 2024, for a specific reason. You were born for such a time as this. You have come into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. God has called you. He has chosen you before he laid the foundation of the world. Listen, you have a job to do. You have kingdom business to do. You have a heavenly assignment that only you can fulfill. Until you die or until the king returns, run with purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs? But only one person gets the prize. So run to win. Hey, you're running anyways. You might as well run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it with, to win a prize that will fade away. We're going to see that in a few weeks in the Olympics. But we do it for an eternal prize. Paul says, so I run. I run with purpose in every step. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless. That's a great word, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those, those of us who know the Lord, those of us who walk in relationship with, with Jesus, he's our savior, we've received salvation. It says that we will stand before him someday. We will stand before Jesus Christ blameless. Think, what does that mean? It means guiltless. It means faultless. It means sinless because of what he's done for you on the cross. It means justified, it means sanctified, it means glorified, it means holy, it means righteous, it means redeemed. It means that you will live in his perfect love, you will live in his perfect peace, you will live in his his perfect joy, you will live in his presence forever. We will stand before him blameless. Whether or not these are the last times, they most certainly are our last times. The question is not, 
am I living? Is this the last generation? Do I live in the last generation? The question is, will you and I live in the one generation that God has given us? Will we occupy and do business until the king returns? Men and women, we can run with the horses. Come on, you can run, you can run, you can run and be prepared for the return of the king. Close your eyes if you would. Close your eyes and in fact, just if you want to, just in a very relaxed way, would you just lift your hands before the Lord in his presence right now? I wanna just pray for all of us here. Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus, the champion of heaven, the king of all kings. Lord, our lives are surrendered to you. And God, we recognize we can't run in our own ability and our own strength. It's not by our own might, our own power. It's by the spirit of the living God. We thank you, Lord, that your spirit in us is greater than the spirit that is in the world. So God, all of these things that we've been teaching on, that we've been talking about, help us to live them out. Help us to embrace them. Show us where we need to grow. Help us to change where we need to. Lord, I pray even for those of us here right now, I just feel prompted that maybe think, I don't know, I don't really know what my specific purpose is. I know I didn't really teach on that give any real practical things on that. But God, I pray even, even in the next week, God, would you speak to them about that? Would you put something in their heart? Would you give them dreams? Lord, would you give them visions? Would you help them to identify why, why they're here right now? What you've called them, created them to do. We could live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can put your hands down, relax for a moment. Just open up your eyes. And I just wanna give one more invitation before we dismiss. But maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching online and you're not in relationship with God, you know about God, but you don't know him personally. Jesus said in John 14, six, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You're not a Christian because you live in the United States, or you grew up in a Christian home, went to Christian school, or even go to church. You, the only way that you become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is at some point you make a choice, you make a decision that you need and want the Lord to be in your life. You say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. I'm a sinner who needs a savior. And you ask Jesus to come in and be your savior into your life and to be your Lord. That means he's the one that you live for. He's your master, he's your boss, he's your owner. You're not living life for yourself or somebody else or something else, you're living your life for him. Nobody can make that decision for you. You have to make that choice yourself. And, and by the way, that choice has significant and eternal consequences for the rest of your life and for all of eternity. Because eternity with God is called heaven, eternal separation from God is called hell. And Jesus came to give you abundant and eternal life. So you can know his love and his joy, his peace, his presence. That's why he came, that's why he lived, that's why he died on the cross, that's why he shed his blood, that's why he rose from the dead, that's why he ascended to heaven, and that's why he's coming back again. He's coming back for his church, he's coming back for those of us who know him. Maybe you've never made that decision before for whatever reason, but you're here today. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. Or maybe you, you prayed a prayer at some point, but you've walked away from the Lord. You're doing your own thing. Maybe you've been running away from the Lord. You're prodigal, you're backslidden, and you need to come back to him today. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that right now. Would you close your eyes one more time? Say, John, that's me. I need to come to the Lord for the first time, or I need to come back to him. I wanna give you that opportunity. I won't embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna make you say anything, but I, I want you to respond in a moment by raising your hand, and then I'm gonna lead you in a prayer of salvation and confession. Everybody else, you can keep your eyes closed. You can be praying. My hands are already going up. That's awesome. And just on, if, if that's you, just put your hand up right now. Just raise your hand and look at me. Open up your eyes as well. I see you too right there. I, I don't know you guys, I, but I noticed you when I was up here dedicating the baby. I'm glad you're here. God loves you. It's a good day for you. Praise the Lord, a couple right here. Anybody else here this morning? Lift your hand and wave at me. I see a hand in the back right there. Praise the Lord. Anybody else here this morning? Just give, give one more moment. Praise God. It's so good. Thank you, Lord. You, you, can, uh, you can open up your eyes, everybody. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, because that's where we believe, it's in our heart, you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I think there's at least three people that I just saw respond and raise their hand. And I wanna lead them in a prayer of salvation, but we're all gonna pray this prayer out loud in support of our friends this morning. Would you repeat this prayer with me, with our friends this morning, a phrase at a time, say it loudly. 
Say, God, thank you for loving me. Come on, say it stronger than that, church. God, thank you for loving me. I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of all my sins. I surrender my life to you. Jesus, be my Lord and be my Savior. I know you died on the cross for me and you rose from the dead for me. Come into my life. Make me a brand new person. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to know you and live for you all the days of my life. I want to run with purpose. And I declare that heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we celebrate that this morning, church? Amen. Amen.